Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a star at the very least on my review of The Wizards of Once by Cressida Cowell. So Cressida Cowell is the author of the How to Train Your Dragon books. This is book one in a new series. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb, then I'll go through it and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts on rating at the end. So, Dane reads... From the multi-million copy selling author of How to Train Your Dragon, Cressida Cowell, the children's laureate 2019 to 21. Once there was magic. This is the story of a young boy wizard and a young girl warrior brought up as enemies. But have they been so busy fighting that an ancient evil has returned unnoticed? Perhaps. Very cool layout of this. Lots of like illustrations and stuff, maps, all of that good stuff. So our main character is called Zar, X-A-R, and it says Zar, pronounced Zar, I don't know why, spelling is weird was a wild young human boy who belonged to the wizard tribe. And we learn a little bit about his retinue here. As the son of the king enchanter and a boy with a great deal of personal charisma, Zar had a lot of followers. A pack of five wolves, three snowcats, a bear, eight sprites, an enormous giant called Crusher, and a small crowd of other wizard youngsters, all following Zar as if hypnotized, all shivering and scared and pretending not to be. So we get this little bit here, which I just, I love what the raven says. Uh, it's all nonsense, smiled Luta. Only a brainless fool like you wouldn't know that. Witches were destroyed forever. Forever is a long word, said the raven. I also don't like that they've used, that she's used smiled as a dialogue tag. I was always taught that, that, it, well, it doesn't make sense to me. You don't smile or what, you don't say, I was always told that I was so sad. You don't talk like that. You might talk and then smile, or you might talk while smiling, but you're still talking, not smiling out words. You can't smile a word. Uh, so also, the, I like the fact that iron is is like the thing to use against magic, because that's what the old legends were that you used it against fairies. And we get chapter two, A Warrior Called Wish, which this is her introduction here, and I enjoyed it a lot. Meanwhile, a stout and terrified warrior pony with two young warriors sitting on its back had set out secretly from Iron Warrior Fort under cover of darkness. Warriors were not supposed to leave the fort after nightfall, for the warriors were petrified of the magic that was out in the forest. Iron Warrior Fort was the largest hill fort you could possibly imagine, with 13 watchtowers and encircled by seven great ditches cut into the hill. How scared these warriors must be of everything that is magic, to have built such a mighty fort, white as bone, with little slit windows like the blink of a malevolent cat. But nonetheless, this particular warrior pony had managed to sneak out without the nervous sentries that clanked their way along the fort walls spotting it. And perhaps, just perhaps, those sentries were right to be anxiously straining their eyes into the endless green wilderness that surrounded and engulfed them, watching, peering, struggling to see what might be out there. So the Princess Wish, she has a magic spoon. Um, and her bodyguard, Bodkin, who is a terrible bodyguard, but you know, he comes into his own during the novel. But anyway, um, they're talking about it. And that spoon is alive, Princess. He's alive, said Bodkin, giving a little shiver of horror as he looked at the spoon. Which means that it is an entirely banned magic enchanted object. Haven't you seen the signs all over Warrior 4? Absolutely no magic, no enchanted objects, no animals indoors. All magic must be reported to a higher authority so that reports can be made and the magic got rid of. I'm not sure he's magic exactly, said Wish, hopefully. He's just a little bendy. Of course he's magic, snapped Bodkin. Ordinary spoons do not jump up and down to get you to stroke them. Ordinary spoons just lie quietly and feed you your dinner. Look at this one, he's bowing to me. So he is, said Wish proudly. Isn't that clever? And Bodkin says she has to get rid of the spoon. And we get, Wish looked very sad indeed. But I kind of identify with the spoon because he's like me. He doesn't fit in with all the other spoons. Which is kind of heartbreaking. So anyway, there, Wish is out in, uh, out in the forest. Um, and we get this. She may have been a somewhat weird warrior princess, but she certainly had courage. You better not follow us, whatever you are, shouted Wish at the terrifying screeching nothingness, for we are armed with an enchanted spoon. The sword, princess, murmured Bodkin through white lips. The sword sounds much more scary. And a sword, shouted Wish, waving the sword in her right hand and the spoon in her left. A sword so dangerous it was locked in my mother's dungeons. So then we go back over to Zar, and Zar, one of the people in Zar's retinue is a giant called Crusher. And uh, we get, I want to read this whole thing out, because I think this is fascinating. It actually reminds me of um, how trolls think in the disc world a little bit, uh, except basically when they're in cold temperatures they get smarter. Um, but yeah, anyway, hmm, said Crusher thoughtfully. There is a bit of a problem, actually, he admitted. But Sar could not hear him because the giant was so far away and he spoke so very, very slowly. 
giants operate in a slightly different timescale from everyone else. However, it didn't really matter because Tsar wasn't listening anyway and the problem that Crusher was thinking about was slightly different from Tsar's idea of a problem. Some people think that because giants talk slowly they must be stupid, but they could not be more wrong. Giants are big and they tend to have big thoughts and Crusher was a long stepper high walker giant, one of the deepest thinkers of all. So the problem, thought Crusher, was this. Was there a limit to the expanding universe or would it go on expanding forever? I told you it was a big problem. If space was infinite and stars are infinite, thought Crusher, didn't that mean that there must also be an infinite number of crushers out there? How was that possible and what were the implications of that? Which was all very interesting, but unfortunately it did mean that although Crusher was holding vaguely onto the rope, his mind was wandering among the stars and therefore he was entirely unaware of any approaching danger. A long step a high walker giant does not make the ideal lookout. And then Zar and Wish meet each other. And um, Zara had always boasted that if he ever met an enemy, he would kill them instantly. But boasts are one thing, and actually killing a real live girl your own age who is right in front of you and clearly terrified, though trying not to be, with a sword you have just cheated her out of, well, that's quite another. And Zara found he could not do it. Uh, and then he gets attacked by the spoon. And we learn that, unlike ogres, giants are vegetarian. Big up giants, although I wish they were vegan. We get a footnote here in the best traditions of Terry Pratchett. I wonder how much she was in inspired by him and influenced by him. Uh, Zar hung the sword from his belt. Footnote, not to be recommended. A sword should always be put safely away in a scabbard, but Zar was not someone who worried much about health and safety. And I thought this was kind of cute as well. Looking into other people's lives when they are not right in front of you is also impossible, probably. I say probably because turning back time and looking into other people's lives when they are not right in front of you are both things that require the kind of magic we call imagination. Zar had not developed that kind of magic yet, any more than he could move objects with the sheer power of his mind or fly without the helpful addition of wings. And I thought this was funny because I'd recently read um, To Be A Cat by Matt Haig, um, which is about, it's kind of like uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis, except a, a, sort of a middle grade version, a kid gets turned into a cat. But that was the book that I read before this, and so it kind of tickled me that we get. Zara opened his rucksack and took out the spelling book to find the spell about turning people into worms. It was right beside the page that told you how to turn people into cats, easy, and cats back into people, trickier. All right, so we get a spelling book, which is quite cute because it's kind of illustrated like the real thing. Um, but one of the things it's got here is that thing you see online all the time where it says, have you noticed that it does not really matter the order you put the letters in as long as you have the first and last letters in the right place? Um, I just thought it was funny that she'd pinch that. And I love this as well, the spelling book lost words. As the long stepper high walker giants crisscross the forests of Albion, their heads smoking, they are also collecting lost and endangered words. The giants view is, if you lose the words to describe things, how can you think about them? Here are some sprite words for things that are in danger of becoming lost. Fizma, rustling noises in grasses. Dragon cold, weather so freezing it makes the breath smoke so that people look like dragons. Harius, frost growing like fungus on dead wood. Will o' the Wisp, trail of light following after sprites as they fly through wood in the darkness. Holloway, paths made through wildwoods by wandering giants. And Cowbelly, word for mud at the bottom of the river. Oh, we also have Elf Locks, the tangled hair of sleepers. Ghost Trails, the light trails made by sprites at night time, see also Will o' the Wisp. Snaily Sludge, the revolting bogey trail left by a rogue breath. Flitters, to move house, go walk about. And I just thought it was cute as well. This, this last page, this final page of this little spell book. I'm kind of get like a book within a book I guess but it says the spelling book thanks you for reading and would gently remind you that things generally turn out all right in the end and they know the book was very confusing to read because lots of the pages were falling out and when they floated back in again they were in a different order and whoever had written it was very disorganized and kept going off on tangents that might lead somewhere or might be dead ends and we get uh wish goes oh my goodness look I'm in this book and crusher how is that possible bodkin squinted over her shoulder well that's just a picture of a girl isn't it it doesn't have to be you the girl has a spoon on her head, which pointed out. Yeah, that probably, that does kind of seal it. It is quite a specific thing. So we meet Encanzo, the king enchanter, Zar's father. There's also this illustration of him. Those are, I guess, pouches, but they look like ball bags to me when I like first glanced at it. And we get this little bit of description of him, which I will share with you guys. The king enchanter was a tall man and magic had made him taller still. It was curiously difficult to look at him, for he always seemed to be very slightly changing shape, blurring in and out at the edges. But underneath the constantly changing outline of his face, where magic came and went like waves on a coastline, he was stern and unbending as a cliff. 
He was such a very powerful wizard that there was something very scary about him, even when he was just standing there quietly. He had one black fingernail on his right hand, and there was a story of how the fingernail had turned that colour, but no one dared ask the enchanter what the story was. Two very large, very old snow cats settled themselves on either side of the enchanter as if they were statues framing a door. And here we get an example of his magic and also some words of wisdom as well. Basically there's been a big kerfuffle, a lot of stuff has got sort of smashed up and ruined. Silence! roared the enchanter. He moved his arms once more and all around the hall where columns and pillars and staircases had been shattered into thousands of tiny pieces by the blast of the spelling ring exploding, the tiny dusty fragments lifted up from the floor and danced in the air like clouds of hummingbees. The enchanter moved his arms as if he were conducting an invisible orchestra and the dust responded to his instructions. It is easy to destroy, said the enchanter, but I am not like a warrior, impressed by destruction. It is far harder to create, and creation is what we wizards are all about. Play, fiddles, play. The fiddles shot up into the air and began to play themselves, and the millions of tiny fragments billowing through the gigantic hall in enormous drifts, like smoke from a forest fire, danced in time to the music with such speeding energy that you could feel the heat coming off them and warming up the faces of the wandering wizards looking up in awe. So I like this, we get uh, bad things that happen in Tsar's room, very very bad things. In order to explain them I will have to go back in time exactly 15 minutes. Of course in real life turning back time is impossible, I think I've already mentioned that. But contrary wise I can do it for I am the god of this story and thus have rather more magic than perhaps is quite good for me. Um, and I don't normally like it when you kind of the author inter inter intersects the story with their own voice but that made me smile so it's allowed. Oh, and obviously some witches turn up because we know that's going to be a big part of the story just by its very nature, but um, turns out witches speak the same language as we do, but each individual word is back to front. So they're saying steer, 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 which means it's here, it's here, it's here, which is kind of terrifying. And then later on Caliburn says, even your father cannot turn back time, Czar. Nobody can turn back time. That is impossible. And I can't remember whether it was mentioned before that in the manuscript or whether the the previous mention of it was the first mention of it and it's just an error that she thought she'd already mentioned it but she hadn't mentioned it until this point. And Caliburn, he kind of gets all of the wisdom in this. So he says there are some things that are done that cannot be undone. Uh, do as you would be done by or you will be well and truly done is a harsh law indeed. That's a lot of duns. And they end up flying on the back of a magical door. Kind of like a magic carpet, except it's a magic door. Um, but we get, even the enchanted spoon had hopped on enthusiastically next to Zara and Wish, and seemed to be looking at Bodkin expectantly, as if he had faith that Bodkin could be the kind of person who would see flying on the back of a door as an exciting opportunity, rather than an act of suicide. But Bodkin enjoys it, he ends up whooping with joy. And we get, uh, Bodkin's father would have been amazed, and not very pleased if he could have seen him now. This is the problem with adventures, they bring out parts of you that you never even knew were there. Which is certainly true in, in Lord of the Rings. Here we get uh, Wish's mum, Queen Sycorax. Nice little illustration over there. And uh, this is quite a nice little paragraph that kind of introduces her personality as well. So, At the entrance of Queen Sycorax, the warriors bowed so low their foreheads nearly hit the floor. Sycorax was scary, but then she was a very great queen, and as Wish said, maybe great queens have to be scary. There were those who said that a woman was too weak to rule a tribe of invading iron warriors, but they said it very, very quietly, just in case Queen Sycorax should hear them. She was lovely, all right, if by lovely you mean pretty. Hair like a golden waterfall, slim as a candle, six feet tall and most of it muscle, all of the sort of stuff that comes in handy if you're going to be a warrior queen and you like to make an entrance. Whether her character was lovely, well, that's an entirely different question and we'll have to see about that. She gets the line, love is always a weakness. And um, so she, she's obviously, she's Wish's mother and she's not very happy that Wish isn't very good at spelling. And Wish says, the thing with spelling is the letters won't stay still. They keep wondering about in my head and I forget what order they were in the first place. And she then says, there are some people who think that spelling might not be as important as the things you are trying to spell. And I wonder if she's dyslexic. It's not like directly mentioned or explained, but it kind of sounds like dyslexia. So we end up in uh, Queen Sycorax's dungeons, which are always filled with noise. An iron music of despair and sweetness all mixed together, for longing does have its own sweetness and beautiful things can come out of pain. Some beautiful writing considering this is a kid's book. Another little piece of wisdom, a maze can be as effective as locks and keys if you're trying to hide something. And I, for some reason, have tabbed out this illustration. I'm not entirely sure why. It's an ice, but they're all pretty nice, you know? And uh, Zara has been imprisoned in the, uh, 
and in the dungeons and we got this little paragraph here letting us, letting us know what's going on meanwhile down in cell number 445 as hour after hour passed with no sign of wish and bodkin and the sword coming to rescue him Zar's spirits were sinking and he was very close to despair of course Sycorax's dungeons were designed with spirit sinking in mind that's part of the point of a dungeon after all you don't design them to be cheerful airy spaces with a nice view and comfy seating and we learn a little secret about Wish here, which gets gets addressed. Hang on a second, said Zar crossly. The person who has magic that works on iron is the boy of destiny. Wish can't be the boy of destiny. She's a girl, for starters. Nobody says the person of destiny has to be a boy, Zar, said Caliburn. This isn't the Dark Ages, you know. Well, it was, actually, but nobody ever thinks they're living in the Dark Ages. And then right at the end, in the epilogue, it's um, signed the unknown narrator. So one of the characters in this, and it's not explained who is narrating the story. My theory is that it's either the sword or the magic spoon. It could be the spoon, I'd love it if it was. Um, but I like that little that little plot device. I assume that's gonna get addressed sort of at the end of the series, but it certainly made me, it made me wanna keep reading just to find out who the narrator is. So the Wizards of Once Boy Cressida Cowl. I mean, it's very different to How to Train Your Dragon other than the fact that it's still got the illustrations and her writing style is quite unique and quite kind of memorable. Um, I enjoyed it probably more so than the How to Train Your Dragon books. I love the sort of setup with the wizards, the warriors and the witches. Uh, I read it over the couple of days on a treadmill, really just binged through it, really enjoyed it. I would give it a strong four out of five and recommend it if you're looking for a book to either read if you just want an easy switch your brain off read or if you're reading to a child because that's who these are designed for. I gave it a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Wizards of Once by Cressida Cowell. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.